you talk to him about you, about you, about you. Because the Bible says the eye of the Lord runs to and fro upon the earth, beholding the good and the evil. It says, neither is there anything that is not manifest before his eyes, or there is nothing that is concealed from his view, or something that he cannot see. Neither is there anything that is hid from his eyes, but all things are naked and open unto him. God sees all hearts. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the hearts. It's a heart matter. So Lord, we come before you. I bring myself before you. Lord, I empty myself this morning as I present myself to you and anything and everything that in any way displeases you and does not allow me to connect with you in the way that I desire. All blockages, all hindrances, all malices, all prejudices, all biases, all hatreds, all remorse, all dislike and distemper. Lord, purge my heart from it. Purge your lies from it this morning, Lord. We are mindful of being in your presence. For in your presence there is fullness of joy when it cannot be accessed in a broken state. So, Lord, may you cleanse us today. May you sanctify us today. May we, O oh God, be positioned as you would want us to, so that we can be recipients of what you have for us, God. Lord, clean us up. Lord, those things, O oh God, that we, 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 we need to let go of, those things that are not viewed or not seen, O oh God, by those who see your faces, those things that are latent, that are buried deep within the recesses of our hearts, that do not conduce to proper worship, Lord, remove it today. Let your will be done. Purge us, cleanse us, sanctify us. Thank you, Lord. Be seated. I've been talking to the church on the subject. Service is a privilege, not a favor. It is voluntary, not coerced. And I want to start my discourse to you over the next few minutes from the standpoint of being able to connect with you in a way that we can connect with God as He really desires. There are so many burdens that I feel in this place this morning. Quite a number of burdens. I feel quite a number of worry. I feel people are worried. The things that constrain you at this point in time. And I don't mean to burst anyone's bubble. But I do want to be obedient to Holy Spirit. I am predetermined the course that I will take. And I feel Holy Spirit pushing me in a different direction. And so I want to speak to the whole question of prerequisites or the things that prepare us to really connect with the prerequisites and character traits. I'm, I'm going to break it down. The prerequisites have to do with those things that will put us in a position that we can connect with God. I know the word of God says, call upon him and he will answer. I show you great and mighty things which you don't know. But where we as the church of Jesus Christ, the bonafide, blood-washed body of believers, where we are concerned, God is taking us to a new level. I submit to you this morning that God is calling this church to a place of consecration. I use the term consecration not flippantly. As we say consecration, now what is consecration? Well, to get holy, to get no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about a personal outpouring of your heart, wherever you are. 
Because God is not pointing a finger at you uh, to pull you down or to drag you down. But what he does want is that he wants your heart. And when God gets our heart, everything is going to be in place. A couple days ago, I heard Dr. Robert Jeffress of the program Pathway to Victory. He was speaking the whole question of righteousness before God. And I refer to that because this is exactly what I have in my notes. So there are some things that I will repeat which are mixed with some of the things that God uploaded to me and some of the things that I extrapolated from what he said. And uh, he spoke of the whole question of righteousness. What is righteousness? And so we understand righteousness from the context in which I'm going to speak to you this morning is twofold. Righteousness means standing in right relationship with God. It means that we have been declared to be righteous. It is not something that we conjure up. It is not a sense of emotion. It is not a feeling. Because I feel good, I am righteous. Because I feel that I have a, a, a connection with God, I am righteous. No. Or because things are going good, and I see answers to my prayer. I see, as we say, testimonies or praise reports. And, and, and so I am righteous. Righteousness, as a matter of fact, I submit to us. It means standing in right relationship with God. And the word of God says that we have been made to become the righteousness of God in Christ. And it says that we have been declared to be righteous. And this speaks of Jesus having gone to the cross and having taken our sins, our imperfections, our flaws, our shortcomings, our inadequacies, our vileness, our continual failures, continual commitments to do better and then falling back into the same thing, repetitious activity that uh, uh, as a were would make us not feel too good about ourselves. But the word of God tells us that we have been made to become. We do not do it. We have been made to become the righteousness of God in Christ. And it is because of what Jesus did on the cross. When Jesus went to the cross and laid his life there on the cross, he died so that we can be dead to everything that would constrain or hold us back in life. Every emotion, every thought, every circumstance, every situation that is of human origin or that is of demonic manipulation, everything that can come against us that will not allow us to enjoy the bounty and the beauty of what God has for us. The Bible tells us that Jesus, he did what? He took our sicknesses and infirmities and he bore them in his body and the tree and his that we be dead to sins with him, alive to righteousness by whose stripes or by whose wounds we have been healed. We have been declared to be righteous. I am righteous in spite of my shortcomings. I am righteous in spite of my failures. I am not saying that there is that personal responsibility and accountability because there is. We have a responsibility that when things do not align itself with what God has for us to bring ourselves into that place before him and to say, God, here I am in the words of the songwriter, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me and because you bid me come to you, Lamb of God, I come back. And in the words of another songwriter, we put our trust in Jesus' efficacious work wrought on the cross. The songwriter captured it in this way. There is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's vein. And sinners plunge beneath the blood, lose all their guilty stain. So we understand it is the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that cleanses us from all sin. 
It's not fashion I'm going to talk about sin. I'm not talking about adultery and fornication and theft and that type of thing. I am talking about falling short of the mark, falling short of God's expectations. And the Bible tells us, hallelujah, that we have been made to become the righteousness of God. What Jesus has done is that he has substituted our madness. He has substituted our pain. He has substituted our sorrow. He has substituted our brokenness. He has substituted our worry. He has substituted our fear. He has substituted our shortcomings. He has taken that unto himself. And he has given us strength. He has given us hope. He has given us encouragement. He has given us enthusiasm. He has given us the will to live. The will to press on. He has given us hope that does not disappoint or make us shame. That's what I'm talking about. So we are in right standing with God. I've been declared to be righteous. In right relationship due to Jesus' finished work on the cross. It is what we call the imputed righteousness of God. That God puts it upon us. We have been declared to be righteous. We have been made to be to become the righteousness of God in Christ. The tense of the phrase is that it is happening now and it continues to be happening during the process of our life. It is cultured what we call the aorist tense, meaning it is happening now and it is continuing to happen. Are you following me? I'm trying to be as simple as I can, but I want you to catch this because when we catch this, some of the other things that I'm going to discuss on, it will become easy for us because we will understand that we are not our own. It is not what I think or how I think about the situation. It is what the Word of God says about it, what the Word of God says about me, what the Word says about how I should approach the thing, how I should approach the matter, how I should deal with the person, how I should deal with the company, how I should deal with the corporation, because I have been declared to be the righteousness of God. I am not my own. I am bought with a price, and so I must glorify God in my body and my spirit which are his. Hallelujah. So I can't say I'm my own man. I will do what I want to. No, 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 no. Not in the house of God. That is what we call carnal behavior. And the Bible says the carnal or fleshly mind is enmity against God. Hear this? It is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. And the poor goes on to say, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. In church, but in the flesh, come on, are praying in tongues, but in the flesh. Knowing a good bit about the word and how to articulate the word, but in the flesh. So the imputed righteousness is an act of the Holy Spirit by our surrender to Christ. It is an instantaneous, it is an instantaneous experience. We we come into our salvation, but we need to grow in grace. There will still be flaws and imperfections, but we grow in grace. God's unmerited favor. As we grow in grace, uh, hallelujah, grace is God's unmerited favor. What we are doing is that we are learning to cast our cares upon Christ. Uh, we are learning uh, to put our flaws and our failures and our shortcomings before him. Uh, we are learning to trust him, to walk with him. Uh, it is what the word of God says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It is not to walk in an inebriated state of drunkenness. It is not to walk with your head in the, high, in the sky like a cloud with all kinds of fanciful thoughts. It means to put your trust completely, absolutely in the Lord Jesus Christ and to give him the helm of control of your life. It means that I have acceded. I have acquiesced this authority. And I'm saying, God, you lead the way. Where you lead me, I will follow. I will go with you. I will go with you all the way. And please, having said that, I commit myself to walking with him. I commit myself to following him. And even 
even though it may seem like a dark place, even though it may seem to be a perilous place, my hope is fixed on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. Hallelujah, because I know, hallelujah, the way he leads me, I will follow, and I can go with him all the way, because he's going to lead me in a plain path. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. Are you hearing me? He leads me the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He protects his name. His obligation to protect me. His obligation to bless me. His obligation to pro pro preserve me. Where he leads me. He leads me the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And here this year, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because he is with me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Has anybody ever been in trouble with their enemies? Have you ever been in a place where people make you their enemies for no apparent reason? There is no justification to them disliking you, to them hating you, to dislike you because of who you are. They dislike you because of your testimony. They dislike you because you don't mess with the crowd. You don't know what they want to do. How do they, and they consider you to be an adversary. And sometimes you don't know it. But they set themselves to destroy you. And to diminish your character. And slander your name. But John, oh my God. The Sabbath said, yeah. Do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? I will fear no evil. This righteousness that I refer to, it is not how we sound when we sing. And I love good worship. Bless God for the worship this morning. And the musicians, bless God. But I, tell, and I must tell you, hallelujah, my mandate is to bring people into a place of wholesome perfection in Christ Jesus. So that you can understand that it is not just dressing pretty and coming into the house of God, fighting. You look fine, but it is about God dressing you up. Hallelujah, with the robe of righteousness and God beautifying you. For the Bible says He beautifies the meek with salvation. He does what He beautifies, He puts some character traits upon you. He causes you to shine forward, He causes you in the midst of opposition and barriers and testings. When people want to cuss you out and when they treat you inappropriately, hallelujah, you are maligned and you are treated unfairly. You can still stand strong with your head high and not wishing to retaliate because you understand that God says judgment is mine, I will repay. And it means I'm not praying for them to dead either because the Bible tells us that God is not good. He's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to everlasting life. But I pray God God open the eye of that person. Lord change the concept of that organization. Lord move in my life and allow me to be that example that will cause even my detractors and those who are fighting against me to come into a place where they are connected with you. Hallelujah. So there will be still flaws and imperfections. But we go, grow in grace, charis, C H A R I S, God's unmerited favor. And when we get into that place and we are connected relationally with the Lord, there are some things that are going to take place. One of the things that will take place is that we we will treat and we will speak concerning our brethren. Oh my God, we with the love that is required. It does not mean that we are going to close our eyes to the flaws and the imperfections of people. No, it doesn't mean that. We will understand though that God says, judge not that you be not judged. For with what, with what judge will you judge? You shall be judged. With what man, what measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you. That God, you are saying things about people and looking at them and, and you are giving them a, a, a report card. Understand the same same thing has happened to you. God is giving you a record, report card also. Oh God, I, 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 I know, I, I know you came together shouting and then the pastor said, 
but my, I, I feel constrained by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit says that we, we've got to be careful about our speech. We've got to be careful about being, of our speech. The whole question of slander and its effect. Joyce Meyer had this, I heard her say recently, concerning slander. She says that what it does, it does not allow that the person who is being spoken about in the, about in the presence of the individual, it changes the opinion of that individual that is being addressed even though the person is trying to maintain neutrality and look at things from a neutral perspective. But when that word comes out of the person who is directing disinformation and misinformation towards that individual, and it is released towards a particular person, it affects that person even though they don't want to receive it. And it affects them in such a way, and it alters their opinion of who that individual really is. And so that's why it's important you do not tolerate slanderers around you. And you do not tolerate people who always have something to say about somebody else. And, and they always cast themselves in a good position. I'm better than him. I'm better than her. And that type of attitude always pulling down somebody. Always having a negative thing to say. It happens right through. But righteousness does not allow for that. It brings me to the whole question of righteousness that is also right acting and practice before Almighty God. Not only is it right standing because we have been declared to be righteous, but it is right acting and right practice before God. It is a saying and doing the things that righteousness flows out of you too. It is not saying that I'm righteous and doing something that is considered to be righteous. Acting in an unrighteous or an, uh, what we call an indiscriminate way. But it means that I am well disposed towards those persons to whom and with whom I connect. So this part of righteousness, it is also referred to as practical righteousness. The fleshing out of a surrendered life on a daily basis. It speaks to one's conduct, behavior, and attitude on all levels and circumstances. It speaks to one's direction, the path or trust of your life, where you are going to in accordance with Godly principles. It speaks to one's desires. In the Bible, Jesus addressing it in Matthew 5, says, Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. It speaks of passion for God and pleasing Him. And so it's important that we understand that we have been declared to be righteous. We are standing in righteousness. But we also, righteousness is an act in or a practice of that relationship with God. This characteristic, this trait that we have. So we need to examine ourselves in that context this morning. And when we do, it brings us to a very important issue that I want to deal with here this morning. The whole question of conflict resolution. Somebody say conflict resolution. And I, I, I just want to look at the whole question of continual forgiveness. But Matthew chapter Matthew chapter 18 from verse 21 on the board. Matthew chapter 18. Hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 18. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. You have the NLT on the board, the New Living Translation. Let me read it from the New King James Version. The New King James, we're going to look at the NLT in a while. Jesus said to them, I do not say to you, in fact, verse 21, then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? What was happening? Why did he say seven times? Because it was generally considered that you could forgive somebody for an infraction, a shortcoming, or some sort of fault or failure up to seven times. After seven times, you were not obligated. It was felt. And that this, 
This particular position was led on by the Pharisees who changed the law and they amended Moses' law and eye for an eye and for tooth for a tooth. And, and this was more or less like an amendment that came on board there. And so when you see Jesus' reply, then be, and then Jesus replied, Jesus said, and I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times a seven. The term there, 70 times seven, seven zero by seven, is actually that, that seven or 70 sevens. The word for sevens is the word heftal, H-E-P-H-T-A-D, heftal. And it means uh, uh, an account of seven sevens, uh, seven sevens are 49. So actually, he's saying in a sense, uh, 490 times for an, a single offense. And, and, and of course, what he's saying is forgiveness all the time. Forgiveness does not mean that I let my God down after you have hurt me. And after you have done maliciously towards me. What it means that I have chosen not to allow your action, not to allow your words, not to allow what you would have done to affect me in a way that I cannot enjoy a relationship with Almighty God. It doesn't mean that what you may have done or said or what you may be doing, it does not mean that it may not have an effect on me, but I have made a choice. Forgiveness is a choice not to be bitter, not to engage in reprisals, to go back and to get even with the individual, but to do it continually all the time. It is not saying that I will divorce myself, although I have a right. Because listen, no one can destroy you without your permission. And no one can undermine you without your permission. They may do that, but if you stand strong in faith and the integrity of your walk with God, eventually God will break through in your life and God will turn things around for you. Oh, help me here, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So it says, till 70 times 7, continual forgiveness. And, 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 and so he, he continues with the passage. He says, the kingdom of God is like a city king who wanted to settle a council. And then he called everybody together and, and uh, he gave them some, some stuff and, and what have you to, to, to put things in order. And... Um, they had to give an account of what was entrusted to them. And verse 28, there is a part, verse 26, there, there is a servant that comes and he was not able from verse 25 to pay what he had owed because he had misused what was given to him. And then there's so he was in a place of ownership to the master. And they're being called to account when the books were checked. He was found to be in default. Even though he tried to cook the books, he could not cook it. Because uh, he had gotten into a place where the behavior became commonplace. And he stopped covering corners. And there are some people who start off uh, and, and uh, they cover their corners and they dot their eyes and cross their teeth. Uh, but sometimes uh, it becomes commonplace, uh, everyday thing. Uh, and, and so they are not as careful as they should be. And it's easy to catch them then. This is what was happening to the servant. And then he came before the master and he begged and he asked for forgiveness. And the master duly forgave him of a large debt. He was supposed to hand over his family and his generations uh, uh, to go to jail and to work uh, until every cent was paid off. Verse 20 said, The master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the death. He was forgiven everything. And he went his way. We're talking about forgiveness unlimited. But then the Bible tells us, and I, I like this book, verse 28. Verse 28 in the New Living Translation. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant, a compatriot, who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. What did he do? He grabbed him by the, the, the king, New King Jesus. He laid hands on him and took him by the throat and said, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down on his feet and begged him, say, have patience with me, I will pay you all. And he would not verse 30. But when and threw him into prison.
answer till he should pay the debt. So news came back to the master who had forgiven this individual of a great debt. And when it came back, the, 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 the master reversed the decision and says, I am putting you in jail now until you pay every cent that you owe me. The old people used to say, do so and like so, come on somebody. Hallelujah. He had a greater debt than a man who owed him something. Yet still, he did not dispense the mercy and the favor towards the man that he experienced. Rather than man, he held it by the shoulder. Some people are so callous. Hallelujah. They do all kinds of things and they can't forgive them. But an individual who has done something that is minute or small, and they magnify that thing, and they make a, a demand an individual to settle their cup right now. That's why we should not, as people who call ourselves Christians, call by the name of Christ, be ready to easily pass judgment on people. The Bible says to judge righteous judgment. And he was incarcerated. And uh, the inference is that it took a long time for him to get out. If he could have gotten out. And as we expand the story, what happened? We see that even this man, he was paid. His debt probably would have been forgiven. In Matthew chapter 5, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus speaks about, put it on the board, Matthew chapter 5. And, and, and Jesus speaks about the whole question of forgiveness again. In speaking of uh, forgiveness from verse 22, uh, from verse 22, look from verse 22. Hallelujah. Jesus said, if I say you are in ground with someone, you are subject to judgment. Uh, if you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of fires of hell. That's not what I want to get to. Uh, come back down to from the earlier verses from verse 15 or so. So Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, I did not take the time to, to really uh, put the course. But, but Jesus said, if you have something against your brother, if you have ought against your brother, somebody say ought. If there is an issue between your brother and yourself. And he uses the term brother. Not necessarily a biological brother, but an individual, an individual who is close to you. And he says if you have ought against your brother, when you come to the altar, when you come to pray, tell somebody when you come to pray, he says, leave your gift at the altar. He says, leave your gift at the altar and go make it right with your brother. He says, leave your gift at the altar and go make it right with your brother. And then come and offer your gift to God. So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, when you come to church, and you remember that someone has something against you. Leave it, make it right. Tell somebody, make it right. You have to make it right. You can't come in God's house with bitterness in your heart and lift your hands and say, I worship you. Oh, Lord, I worship you. No, no, no. It is not going to work. It is contaminated worship. It is polluted worship. God does not accept that thing. Oh yes, and sometimes we are deeply grieved because of the hurt that we have been subjected to. And I understand that. And what you should do is to say, Lord, help me to get over this thing. Lord, I forgive this individual or those individuals or this company or this corporation. And Lord, I choose to allow you to take charge of this situation because I know that if I regard iniquity in my heart, that you will not hear me. And Lord, I cannot afford that. So Lord, help me to get over the bitterness. Help me to get over the pain. Help me to have a correct attitude towards the individual Lord. It's not about me, Lord. It's not about how I feel about it. Hallelujah. It is what you say about my situation. And you said in Matthew 6, 14 and 15 that if I do not forgive men my trespasses, neither will you, Heavenly Father, forgive me my 
may be better than the altar. To make it right. Make it right with God. Look at yourself rather than looking at the other individual. And allow God to have his way in your life. To bring you to that place. Tell somebody quick forgiveness. Jesus also said, when there is a dispute among you, he says, agree with your adversary quickly. Lest you go to court and judgment be entered against you. And you face a long time in prison. He says, let there be mediation. Let there be conciliation. Agree with your adversary, with your, adversary, with your opponent, the prisoner, with whom you are not ahead. Agree with them quickly. Whether it be a husband or a wife, a brother or a sister, some other person in your life who may have crossed your path and caused pain and worry, agree quickly, resolve the issue. Because if it goes to court and judgment is entered against you, you are likely to face a greater sentence, but it could be avoided. And that is why the word of God says, when issues arise, why do you not suffer yourself to be defrauded? Why do you not rather take wrong? Sometimes you want to hold on and say, well, I'm right and I'm right and I'm going and fighting it. And sometimes we get wrong because sometimes people hold on to positions and hold on to attitudes that they know to be wrong. And what they have done essentially is to change the truth of God into a lie. They know it's a lie, but they have spoken about it so much and they believe by continuous repetition it becomes the truth because it is repeated into the hearing of other individuals. And you may, you may confess those other persons, but remember there is a God who sits high and looks lower and he sees you and even though you try to alter the truth by repetition of falsity, repetition of falsity, God knows that, come on God knows your true position God knows and God is going to judge based on what is the truth and not what you are spouting and the truth to be very careful to see people who are predisposed to comments that back and out and hear people talk to them you will find yourself in real problems the Bible tells us about changing the truth of God into a lie and the Bible tells our persons who believe that lie the Bible says uh, because they choose to believe a lie and this is said in the, in the context of a moral situation that had arisen in the church, sexual immorality in the church. On the leader ground. And then there are uh, some, something that I'm not going to go into here. At this point in time, it was a stated position that goes against the narrative of God's word. That God does not condone this type of behavior. And, and, uh, and uh, rather, what was happening, they were endorsing what was prevalent in the society in that day. And the Bible tells us that, uh, read Romans chapter 1, it says, because, uh, hallelujah, they did not believe the truth. Uh, the, the Bible says, for this God, of course, God sent them strong illusions. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Tell somebody forgiveness. forgiveness. Jesus prayed for forgiveness. And the cross when faced with them is impending crucifixion. It says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus had thrown out the carpet, so to speak. Healed the sick, cast out them, was raised the dead, brought families back together, reunited society, put them in a proper understanding as to what was God's path putting them in clarity with respect to the scripture. And then they cried, away with him, crucify him. Jesus, knowing what will happen, says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Forgiveness is epitomized, epitomized in, 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 in the old question of uh, the prodigal son, what we refer to as the prodigal son, or the lost son, as some Bible translations would have it. In Luke chapter 15, you can read from verse 11 to 31. You know the account. Here is this father. The son comes to him 
and the son is a bit precocious, he says, Father, give me my inheritance. By asking the father to do that based on the custom of the day, what actually was happening is that he was insulting the father. In essence, he was saying, Father, uh, you're good as dead. Uh, the father did not have to do it, uh, but the father allowed him the expression of free thought, uh, allowed him to make the decision. Sometimes, amen, even with children and what have you, you have to allow them to make mistakes. I'm talking about adult children. Are you hearing me this morning? Sometimes there are persons that you are ministering to and you're talking to them over and over again. You have to allow them to make their own mistakes. Leave them up to themselves. And so he had duly went away. He wasted his money on prostitution and all sorts of things. He came back home broken. He came to himself. He was in the pig pen. Literally eating hot food, something that was unheard of from where he came from. Came back home and the Bible says, when he was a long way off, the father saw him coming. Because hear me this morning, it doesn't matter how far we go, Father God is always looking out for us. Father God is always looking out for us. Are you hearing me? There is nothing that we can do or say or any action that we can then take to that will make God turn his back against us and say, forgive us. As long as there is life, there is hope, there is a way. Father was looking for him and saw him hear this a long way off and ran towards him. This old man, my God, even though he may have slowed considerably, because you know trouble has a way of slowing you. I don't know if you have ever been under some pressure as a parent or, or somebody charged with responsibility because sometimes it gets so burdensome and so onerous that you feel I can't even move. You're sleeping a whole lot. You seem to be oppressed. You don't know what to do. You are crestfallen. You are heartbroken. Oh my God, but there was an injection of adrenaline when he saw the sun coming back home. Can I say this morning, for every lost sinner, for every lost son, everyone who was in church, and because of circumstances, and having made mistakes, and fallen by the wayside, our Father is still looking, and when you start your journey back, the adrenaline kicks in, and he says, go for it, boy, go for it, girl, hallelujah, God in the way, and the man came back home, when he came back home, there are a couple of things that happened, he was reaccepted into the house to start with. Somebody who said, not back in this house, but he got back to the same house. Remember when he left, he was in a dire state. He was in a state where he didn't have clothing, proper clothing. He was not smelling good. After the long journey, he did not have a change of clothing. He got back home in a pitiful state. He got back like a mendicant, a beggar. Hallelujah. Oh, but what did the Father do? The Father allowed him to have a bath. Oh my God, the blood of Jesus cleanses us. The blood of Jesus sanctifies us. The blood of Jesus purifies us. The blood of Jesus purges us. When he was washed, he put a robe on him. The Bible tells us about the robe of righteousness. The Bible speaks of the washing of the water of the word. You see, when you get the word of God into your spirit and you apply yourself to that word, it begins to clean you up, clean up your thinking, clean up your believing, clean up your distortions, and put you in a better place. And the cleaning up leads to a place of you voluntarily accepting the cleansing. And now there is a robe of righteousness that is placed upon him. And if that were not enough, the Bible tells us sandals were placed on his feet. The Bible says having our feet shut with the gospel of the preparation of peace. Now he was back in a peaceful place. Now he was back in a place where the word was actually a meaning to him. The benefits of the word. Hallelujah was now experiencing Hallelujah, then he was reconciled. The father did what? Put a ring on his finger. There was full reacceptance of this young man. And as if that was not enough, the Bible tells us that uh, he ordered the father, ordered to kill the fatted calf, kill the best thing. God wants you to have the best. God wants you to have access to the best. Are you hearing me? 
fear. Don't let anybody tell you to make do with a little thing. And I'm going to anger some bodies and anger some people. A little piece of this, a little bit of money, a little piece of house, a little piece of that. As soon as righteousness, the devil is a liar. You may start small, but God's going to lift you up while you hear me. The Bible says, He lifts the needy out of the downhill and sets them among princes. P R I C N C S. Those in line to the throne. Yes, even the princes of His, God's people. You are destined, you are being set up for promotion into a bountiful place, into a blessed place. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Solomon prayed and asked God. Says, God, give me wisdom to rule all. And to be able to please you. And then God said to Solomon, because you have asked for wisdom to rule the people, to be a blessing to society, I will give you more than that. I will make you wise like no ever, no one ever was before, or ever shall be after as a man of the earth. But in addition to that, I will give you gold and silver. I will bless you in a way that will stagger the mind and bottle the imagination. Hallelujah. And the Bible tells us that Solomon went home to make a fast sacrifice. He began to sacrifice unto the Lord. And God blessed him over beyond what he could ever hope for. Just want to pause. Because some people will say you don't deserve it. Look at all you did. Look at where you came from. Look at all your mistakes. Just like the brother who stayed home all the time. They're thinking there were some church people. They watch people walking in the house of God. And their growth is meteoric. Their rise is meteoric. Because they love God and they're there all the time. Stiff and starchy. And what have you. And they have their mouth to run on other people. He just come. She just come. Look at what they're doing after and now. Look at what they're doing. And they just come. That was the brother. Look at all that happened before. Hallelujah. The brother came in. What is the meaning of the music? Uh, when it was told that his brother came home, he was irate. Rather than running in to go hug his brother, you know what he did? He went out, he stopped out. The father said to call him. He was very disrespectful and did not come. Hallelujah. And he was pouting and scoffing outside there. And when he eventually spoke to the father, he said, This boy, this man, this thing, wasted all your substance in wild living. And look at how you bless him now. Tell somebody grace. Oh my God, say grace, say grace, grace. Unmerited favor. Hallelujah. Don't tell me what I did. Don't tell me where I was. Tell me who I am. Hallelujah. Tell me where I am. For I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I have been accepted into the beloved. I am a member of his body, his flesh and his bones. Jesus' blood took care of the past and obliterated the sin, obliterated the shame, obliterated the shortcomings. And now I'm washed. Hebrews 6 and 11. Now you are washed. Now you are sanctified. Now you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Celebration and merriment. Mm. I want to close. I want to deal with somebody else and something else and, and close. This reciprocal forgiveness. Oh God. We God open our eyes this morning. When you get into a state, there is a saying that prayer changes things. But I submit to us this morning that prayer does not only change things, but prayer creates the things. Are you hearing me this morning? If you turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 1 and 3, just put it on the board for me here. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 3. You know that passage phrase is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in the days of old earned a good reputation for history is what I want to get to. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. The King James, I like how he puts it in verse 3. In the King James, it says, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Amen. By faith, we understand. Yeah. By faith, what God says, the revelation of what God has declared. For the Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So by the declared word of God, what God says in his word concerning us and who we are, we understand that the world is not just the earth, but the galaxies and everything around. The words were framed by the word of God. And I want to say to you this morning that prayer does not only change things, hallelujah, but prayer creates things. What you say becomes a reality. The Bible says, by your words, you shall be justified. The words were formed. How did God form the world? God spoke the world into existence. God said, let there be and it was so. Let the waters bring forth abundantly and it was so. You have got to understand that the Bible says, as Jesus was and is in the world, even so are we. If Jesus used words to change the environment and create things, then you have the ability to do the same thing also. Read Matthew 11, 23. It says, if you shall say to the mountain, if you shall give it an instruction, it will obey you, and it will do what you say it will be, what it will do. The Bible tells us, James says, ah, Elijah was a man just like us, but he prayed. Somebody said, pray. How did you pray? Wow, earnestly, meaning in faith, trust in God, knowing that the God in whom he reposed his trust was able to change things. And I'm saying to you this morning, there are many of you, based on your relationship with God you are finding yourself uh, in sometimes a very difficult place uh, and it's okay to pray by prayer I mean you articulate what your situation is uh, before God, uh, you let him know that, uh, the Bible says uh, your heavenly father knows what you have need of uh, before you ask him uh, but Jesus went on to say ask and it shall be given you seek and you shall find uh, not and shall be open. Uh, he says everyone who asks receives uh, Hallelujah, everyone who knocks has the door open unto him. Uh, in Luke chapter 11, Jesus said, Which one of you, having a child, you should ask for bread, you will give him a stone. Or you will ask for an egg, you will give him a scorpion. Or for a fish, you will give him a serpent. He says, If you be evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give good things to those that ask him? In other words, he's going to exceed your expectations. And that's why the word of God says he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all. And let's stop asking God for a little something. Hallelujah. Let God, God, Lord, just let me pay my rent. God, just let me pay my mortgage. The devil's a liar. How will we leave it, God, to pay off for your house? How will we leave it, God, to finance your business? How will we leave it, God, to trust you in your career? How about believing God to put you in business? How about believing God to complete your degree and to graduate with first class? Come on. I'm talking to the church this morning because the Bible says that we are the head and not the tail. We are brother and not beneath. And everything we send our hand to do shall prosper. This is not materialism. This is not manon. Manon is ungodly wealth. But this flows directly out of the world. Hallelujah. God says, I'm making to be the head and not the tail. You shall be above all me and not believe. Read Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 14. God has blessed you. Bless your seed. Bless your property. God will give you goodly houses to dwell in. Hallelujah. You did provide. Are you hearing me this morning? Deuteronomy 8, 18. 
It is the Lord who gives you the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant. God doesn't want you catching your tail. If you're catching your tail now, that's okay. Because God will make a way for you. Hallelujah. He will bring you through. He will turn things around for you. He's more than able. I said he's more than able. He's more than enough. Pure God, I am a charity. Hallelujah. Take your heels in. Stop your feet. Show your face. And say if it's a fight you want. A fight you get. But there is only one victorious person. And that's me. Because I'm more than a conqueror. In Christ Jesus. I want you to ignite your faith. And know that God doesn't want you struggling. Stone away, hallelujah. 
hallelujah, when the stone is rolled away, everything ain't exposed before him. He didn't ask why he didn't get the correct medicine and why uh, this happened and this didn't happen. No, no, no. He dealt with business. You want somebody to take care of the business of your brokenness and of your pain and of your sorrow and then bring it to Bring the thing down. And we're going around the island and people that we got to come the last night of that meeting. 
Mitega. People were all over the world. But as far as the eyes can see, cars lined up because God's power was being manifest. And I remember there were not many people that I laid hands on. It's as though that the Lord was just on the side there and miracles were taking place. And this young man, through the word of knowledge, was able to take authority over the spirit of paralysis and he was instantly delivered. Not, he, not, not talking or doing anything, he was instantly healed by the power of God. Right here in Trinidad, hallelujah, young woman, young woman, a teacher, a school teacher, got into that hall with another friend and we parked, walked in there that evening. I felt that God wanted to heal somebody. We were going from house to house to talk with people and pray with people. I said, God's going to heal somebody. And when I looked at this uh, start, there was a young woman that began to shake fire and then convulsed in the corner. I said, God's going to set you free. And uh, she went to all kinds of stuff, all kinds of opium and did medical uh, checks on her and could find nothing. And she was home there. I said, people do one thing. He took authority over that devil in the name of Jesus. Within a minute, she was totally healed by the power of God. I'm not talking Nazi stories. I'm telling you about real things. And if I tell you, make your hair stand up in your head. And so, those of you who are getting ready to close this live stream, but I want to pray for you in your homes, wherever you are across the nations of the earth, I want to pray for you. Hallelujah. You have children who have problems and issues with the children. I want to pray for that. I want to pray firstly for that. And then pray for other situations. And so Lord, in the name of Jesus, I bring this to our local assembly here this morning. And, and those who are listening via live stream across the nations of the earth. And I simply send your word of healing and deliverance. And I bring every yoke. I pray for children who are under the oppression of demonic spirits. In the name of Jesus, Lord, that mother who called me and said to me that her seven-year-old son was missing like a snake. I take authority right now over that demonic spirit that is causing that child to hiss like a snake. I speak to you, you foul demonic spirit, and I command you as a servant of God with the authority of God. I command you the power of that child's body and go. He is my Christ. He belongs to Christ, the blood of Jesus. I cast you out, loosen the door in the name of Jesus. I break every oppression of our little children. Hallelujah. Demonic oppression is over their life. I break it in the name of Jesus. I set them free. Oh, we are men. Oh, we are chained by bondages.